Okay, we are going to pick up um, in video 2 of chapter 13 with blocking. When groups of experimental units are similar, it's often a good idea to gather them together in blocks. Blocking isolates the variability due to the differences between the blocks so that we can see the differences due to the treatments more clearly. When randomization occurs only within the blocks, we call the design as randomized block design because you separate your your subjects into the blocks and then you randomize from there. So here is a design, a diagram of a blocked experiment. So remember in the book they talk about the 12 tomatoes from store A and the 6 from store B. And so they, they think that the store that the tomato comes from might affect its juiciness and tastiness. So what they decide to do is just separate the tomatoes based on their store of origin. Now, um, Notice there's no random assignment when they're split into the blocks because that, there wasn't a random assignment. The tomatoes came with that characteristic. Okay, you don't randomly assign which store they came from. Twelve of the tomatoes did in fact come from store A and six tomato plants did in fact come from store B. Now, once you've got them in the blocks, then you randomly assign them to the three different treatments. And so you can see the random assignment occurred within the individual blocks and you evenly distribute the members of each block to the treatment groups. In a retrospective or prospective study, subjects are sometimes paired because they are similar in ways not under study. Uh, matching subjects in this way can reduce variability in much the same way as blocking. Matching can also be done in an experiment. They're basically um, just blocks of two. Blocking is the same idea for experiments as stratifying is for sampling. Both methods group together subjects that are similar and randomize within those groups as a way to remove unwanted variation. We use blocks to reduce variability so we can see the effects of the factors. We're not usually interested in studying the effects of the blocks themselves. Adding more factors. It is often important to include multiple factors in the same experiment in order to examine what happens when the factor levels are, are applied in different combinations. That goes back to that whole idea of looking at diet and exercise together. Okay, so for example, the following diagram shows a study of the effects of different fertilizer water combinations on the juiciness and tastiness of tomatoes. So. There's the 12 tomato plants from a garden store, and if you look, there are six different treatment groups. There's the first treatment is control and no water. Treatment two is half a dose, no water. Third treatment is full dose, no water. And then if you look in treatments four, five, and six, you've got the control, half dose, full dose again, but they are all in combination with water. And so you end up with six different groups. Each group has two plants in them, and then you're gonna compare the, the juiciness and tastiness. Confounding. When the levels of one factor are associated with the levels of another factor, we say that these two factors are confounded. When we have confounded factors, we cannot separate out the effects of one factor from the effects of the other factor. Lurking or confounding. A lurking variable creates an association between two other variables that tempts us to think that one may cause the other. This can happen in a reg regression analysis or an observational study, and we'll talk about regression analysis later. A lurking variable is usually thought of as a prior cause of both Y and X. That makes it appear that X may be causing Y. Remember we talked about the example where when ice cream first came out, people thought it might be causing an increase in deaths by drowning and it, because whenever ice cream sales went up, so did deaths by drowning, but then they found out that actually high temperatures of the summer months were causing people to eat more ice cream. High temperatures of the summer months meant more people were going swimming, so it was actually just because it's warm and hot during summer, that was the cause of both increased ice cream sales and increased deaths deaths by drowning. Confounding can arise in experiments when some other variables associated with the factor has an effect on the response variable. Since the experimenter assigns treatments at random to subjects rather than just observing them, a confounding variable can't be thought of as causing that assignment. And so since there's not some confounding variable causing an individual's choice of treatments, we take that out of the equation. 
A confounding variable then is associated in a non-causal way with the factor and affects the response. Because of the confounding, we find that we can't tell whether any effect we see was caused by our factor or by the confounding factor or by both working together. Okay. So we try to take that out of the whole equation by assigning the subjects to treatments at random so that the, whatever confounding um, variable might cause a subject to choose a particular treatment, that's not involved because they've been randomly assigned to the treatments. What can go wrong? Don't give up just because you can't run an experiment. If we can't perform an experiment, often an observational study is a good choice. Be aware of confounding. Use randomization whenever possible to ensure that the factors not in your experiment are not confounded with your treatment levels. Be alert to confounding that cannot be avoided and report it along with your results. Sometimes that happens. You realize after the fact or you realize, oh, there could be something confounding what we're seeing and you just have to report it. Bad things ha can happen even to good experiments. Protect yourself by recording additional information. Whenever you're conducting an experiment, record, record, record. Whatever happens needs to get written down. Don't spend your entire budget on the first run. Try a small pilot experiment before running the full-scale experiment. You may learn some things that will help you make the full-scale experiment better. Okay, examples. Example one, heart attacks and heights. Researchers who examined health records of thousands of males found that men who died of myocardial infarction, heart attack, tend to be, to be shorter than men who did not. Question A, is this an experiment? If not, what kind of study is it? No, there was no random assignment of treatment height to the subject's men. This was an observational study, probably retrospective. The way it reads, it sounds like it's retrospective. Question B. Is it correct to conclude that shortness causes heart attacks in men? Explain. No, correlation does not imply causation. Although it is possible that shortness causes heart attacks, it is also possible that there is another variable that is the cause uh, of the increased risk of heart attacks. Example two, bipolar. Over a four-month period among 30 people with bipolar disorder, patients who had been randomly assigned to receive a high dose, 10 grams per day, of omega-3 fats from fish oil improved more than those given a placebo. Is this an experiment or an observational study? Now, it says they're randomly assigned to either getting a high dose or not, so it's a, an experiment. Okay, since it's an experiment, we have certain follow-up questions. First one, who were the subjects studied? bipolar disorder patients. What is the factor involved in this study and how many levels are there? Well, there's one factor given at two levels, 10 grams per day and zero grams per day or the placebo. So the placebo has none. How many treatments are there? Well, there's two because there's only one factor. The number of treatments is equal to the number of levels of that factor. What is the response variable measured? Improvement in bipolar symptoms. So fewer symptoms would be what I would guess. Is it a blinded study? Well, since there's a placebo, yes. Um, we're not told if it was double blind. We don't know if the, the evaluators knew who was receiving the fish oil supplement and who was being given the, the placebo. What conclusion can be drawn? High doses of omega-3 fats from fish oil, oil cause improvement in symptoms for people with bipolar disorders. And we can, we can say that because this was an experiment. Example three, mother, women with sons. In 2002, the journal Science reported that a study of women in Finland indicated that having sons shortened the lifespans of mothers by 34 weeks per son, but that daughters helped to lengthen the mother's lives. The data came from church records from the period 1640 to 1870. Is this study an experiment or an observational study? So you stop and you ask yourself, well, was there any assignment of subjects to treatments? Were women assigned to having sons and daughters? No, that's not even really possible. So it's an observational study. So we have kind of a different set of follow-up questions for the observational study. There's probably some overlap, but, but there's some things that are different. Is the study retrospective or prospective? Well, since they are looking back at, at church records from 1640 to 1870, it's going to be retrospective. Who were the subjects? Women in Finland. 
What is the parameter of interest? The length of um, life for the women, the lifespans, so the women's lifespans. Can a causal relationship be established? No, because it was just an observational study. There were no um, random assignments. So the women were not randomly assigned to have sons or daughters, so it has not been established that having a son is the cause of the women's shortened lifespan. It could be that something with the physiology of a woman makes her more likely to have son, a son and more likely to have a shorter lifespan. Okay, there, there could be some other variable that explains it. Example four, so our last example, gas mileage. Do cars get better gas mileage with premium instead of regular unleaded gas? It might be possible to test some engines in a laboratory, but we'd rather use real cars and real drivers in real day-to-day -day driving, so we get 20 volunteers. Okay, so I want you to design the experiment and then explain how you would carry out the random assignment of subjects to treatments. Okay, for part A, you need to indicate that, there, that you're going to do random assignment of 20 volunteer drivers. And then you need to show with the arrows that um, you're going to have one group that gets premium gas. And you want to indicate that half of your volunteers will be assigned to that group. So that's why you put 10 there. And then you want to show your second group. And our second group is going to get regular um, unleaded. And so we want to show that 10 people are going to be assigned to that. And then we look and we're going to compare gas mileage. That is how you would tell whether that is our response variable. The question is, do cars get better gas mileage? So there we go. And so um, now we want to explain how we would carry out the random assignment of subjects to treatments. I am going to use the hat method. You don't have to. You can use random digit table. You can use random number generator. I'm going to write pay, uh, names on slips of paper and use a hat. I would write the name of each of the 20 volunteers on separate, identical slips of paper. I would put the slips of paper in a hat and mix well. That's how we indicate that we're randomizing um, the selection. You always want to in put that little step in there. The, I would draw out 10 names without looking. Again, that's important for the randomization and chance. And without replacement, that's an important step. You don't look at a person's name, write it down, and throw them back in the hat. These 10 individuals would be assigned to premium gas. The 10 individuals whose names remain in the hat would be assigned to regular gas. Okay. So that is how I would carry out the random assignment. And notice, you don't have to indicate that if you're just asked to design the experiment, but if you're asked a follow-up question, then you need to be that specific about how you would actually do the, the assignment. Okay, guys, that's it. Um, make sure that you're, you bring your outline and the notes that you took from this video back to class next class period, and we will work problems.